won't ever let you down He got you Love is amazing, His grace is bringing you every day And if you ask me, you receive abundantly, abundantly in it's favor Hello everybody, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Pastor Nyasha Chikengeja and today I will be uh, leading you uh, in a discussion, continuation um, on the discussion around the Lord of the Breakthrough. Um, last week Pastor Sylvan was here and I'm sure you had an amazing time, a splendid time as we got to analyze the scriptures and discuss um, what the word of the Lord says about him being the Lord of the Breakthrough. Um, the week before last, um, I joined him as we introduced um, this discussion and we started off on um, uh, uh, the introduction was around the fact that there is no word that represents the word coincidence in the Hebrew word. Uh, in other words, nothing happens by chance in life. And um, he did mention um, the anchor scripture on that point that was Psalms 37, 23. And he mentioned that we do live our lives, you know, believing that things just happen, but rather we believe or rather we should believe that our steps are ordered of the Lord. Everything that we do in life, the Lord has already planned it. The, the Lord has already um, prepared, uh, you know, the capacity of the grace that needs to carry us in that specific season. And we did talk about the fact that the Lord planned each and everything that concerns us. And he, nothing takes him by surprise. He's never shocked by the events of your life. And then we went on to discuss about the word of the Lord. Um, and I remember this was one of my favorite discussions that we had in the past three weeks where we got to analyze the nature of God's word. And, and, and our anchor scripture for that point was Hebrews 4 verse 12, um, which says, which reads, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And we went on to discuss um, and analyze that scripture to say what was the Lord trying to say about his word the word of the Lord is compared to a sword the word of the Lord is not just some ancient words on a piece of paper it is alive and living and I remember going through the definition of what a living thing is what do we mean when we say something is alive what do we mean when we say that um, um, there's 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 um, there's life into this thing um, and the definition of living of a living thing or rather when we say something is alive it means that life um, is, 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 um, is, is it means of having a breath you know having um, breath the capacity to breathe the capacity to respond. Living things have a variety of characteristics that are displayed to different degrees. They respire, living things move, living things respond to stimuli, they reproduce, they grow, and are dependent on their environment. And um, I, we went on to discuss that, meaning to say that the Word of God, since it is referred to being as active and alive, it is busy and waiting to move and to respond to stimuli, reproducing and growing things in our lives. And we, we continue steadily in the Word of God. We, we are constantly reminded and encouraged to read the Word of God, to use the Word of God as, as, as your basis for declaring promises that the Lord has mentioned, has declared over your life. And as we go on, we went on, uh, you know, analyzing the Word of God. In analyzing the anchor scripture, Hebrews four twelve, we did mention that the Word of God. It, it is mentioned in the Word of God that it penetrates and pierces even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit. Here, the Word of God is, uh, you know, acknowledges that the man is uh, a tripartite in the likeness of the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The only way we can be able to distinguish between the soul and the spirit is by the word of God. It is only the instrument that is sharper enough to penetrate the soulish to what is spiritual. In other words, we're talking about having to distinguish what is natural and what is spiritual, what is flesh and what is in the spirit realm. The only thing that can be able to assist you as a child of God and as a believer 
to notice that there's something going on. This is this is this is this this is the flesh and this is the spirit. The only thing that can be able to help you is the word of God. As we dwell in the word of God. You know, last night we were at the at the prayer watch, and I remember leading on a prayer point that mentioned to say there is going to be the, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Dr. McConey has been speaking on um the different feasts you know for the children of israel and he mentioned um that you know and right now we're just talking about the pentecost the feast of the pentecost that represents the holy spirit and he mentioned that there's going to be an outpouring of the holy spirit and even as we as a movement as celebration church international uh, pastor tom has declared that this year is the year of abiding in the holy spirit and i pray that this year as you abide in the holy spirit and the holy spirit begins to reveal certain things in your life you're able to take the word of god and the word of god is able to change and to transform you from the inside out Hallelujah. So it is important to discern what is spiritual and natural, but the only way we can be able to do it is by the word of God, when we dwell in the word of God. And I remember we did mention in that session that, you know, your response to the word of God really matters. First Thessalonians 2 verse 13, it says, um, this was when Paul was, um, you know, excited and he was happy about this, the, the Thessalonica church and uh, on how they had responded to the word of God, how they had responded to the gospel. And he says uh, in First Thessalonians 2 13, he says, and we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, that is the church of Thessalonica. When you heard from us, when you received the gospel, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is. That is the word of God, which is indeed a work in you who believe. And I remember we talked more about this and we said, your response to the word of God really matters. You know, the word of God is spoken each and every time. The word of God is always alive. The word of God is consistent. The word of God is faithful. However, how we respond to the word of God really matters. How the word of God works for you and performs for you has all to do to, has all to do with how you receive it. If you receive it as the word of men, if you just receive it as pieces of, you know, uh, as words on a piece of paper that were re written in ancient days, that's how it shall be to you. It will never be effective. It will never work for you. The effectiveness of the word of God is up to you. You need to believe for it, for it to work. It is, it, and we discussed about how it is true, um, you know, how, how the word of God still upholds the very nature of who God is and the truth of our identity in Jesus Christ. So I, 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 I encourage you, if you did not go through um, the first session that we did, uh, that was the last, um, the, the week before last, um, I encourage you to just go back and listen on how we discussed, um, you know, various points around the word of God and how our lives have already been planned, you know, by the Lord. Nothing catches him by surprise. And um, Pastor Sylvan then went on last week um, when he took the session um, uh, to, 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 um, to explain um, the unchanging nature of God. And he did mention that there's so many ways that are used to describe the nature and the character of God. And the scripture is littered and repeat uh, with various words and adjectives that help us to understand that God is unchanging. I mean, the word of God is full of scriptures and portions of scripture that mention how God is so consistent, how God is so faithful. In Hebrews 13, 8, it speaks to his steadiness, his reliability, his, un his unchangeable, his consistency, his unshakable, his lasting, his abiding, his enduring, his persistent, and his perpetual. Jesus Christ never changes. And that reality for me, I, I remember, um, you know, when, when I was going through the notes and we were discussing with Pastor Sovin, and I remember saying that, you know what, it's amazing that I, I go in and out of seasons, I go in and out of emotions, but in my inconsistency, God still remains my father. God still remains the same. God still remains 
faithful. I still find him where I left him, you know, and um, he is what he is and he will be what he will be. What he did then, he will do today. He is unchanging. And I, I encourage you to take hold of this truth, to take hold of this reality that God never changes. What he did for Esther, what he did for Hannah, what he did for Samuel, how he walked with Ezra, how he led Nehemiah, how he led the children of Israel, how he fought for them, how he was so vulnerable with David, how he protected and was with Job. He is the same God who's able to do that for you. You know, the word of God is consistent. His character is consistent. The situation does not change him. Your situation, your life experiences, what you have gone through, what you are going through, what you have said of him and what you think of him at times, when in hard times and in dry times, does not change who he is. And I pray that we continue and still go back, even when we're in dry season and difficult seasons, you know that God never changes. His character is faithful. He is a faithful and unchanging God. And then he went on to talk about how progressive God is. God is not a stagnant God. God is a God that wants us to move from one level to the next. He is a God that wants us to move from one glory, level of glory to, to another level of glory. And um, of the many words used to describe God, um, the one that he mentioned, Pastor Subin, was to say, you know, people are normally overlook what God is and, and how progressive he is. He's a God that takes you from another situation or another level of understanding to another level of understanding, from another level of maturity to another level of maturity. He's a God of advancement. You advance, you grow, you mature. This also speaks to fruitfulness. You know, fruitfulness means that there has been progressiveness from the time the seed was planted to the time, you know, the plant now bears fruit. There is progression. There is no, you know, stagnancy. You know, the perfect example that Pastor Sovin was talking about last week was talking about the, the children of the children of Israel were from the time that they were in Egypt into the wilderness up until the time that the Lord, Lord led them into Canaan from faith to faith, from glory to glory, from the bottom of the pit to the palace, that's Joseph, from the prison to the prime rulership, from the bottom of the mountain to the summit of the mountain. If God is a God of advancement, the enemy, the enemy is on the other side, the opposite of that. Meaning to say, if you find yourself in a space where you are stagnant, if you find yourself in a place where you are not moving, if you find yourself in a place where you're frustrated and you, there, there's no movement, there's no maturity, there's no growth, then you know that the enemy is there because the God that we believe in, the God that we trust in is a God of advancement. So now we want to stand and to reason, therefore, that God is a God of seasons. He then started talking about seasons and the enemy is on the other side. He is the orchestrator of cycles. So stagnancy, instead of talking about stagnancy and how stagnancy resembles, or rather cycles, you know, you keep on going round and round and round and round, repeating the same cycle, repeating the same experience, and you're not moving. That is um, uh, 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 the fruits that come from the spirit of stagnancy. But the fruits of, um, the fruits of pro productiveness, the, pr the fruits of progressiveness and advancement, you move from one season to another another and thus he says you know the lord when the lord wants to mature you he, he moves you from one level to another from glory to glory when the enemy comes in into your life he, he wants to keep you stagnant you don't move you're not going anywhere god's desire is for you to progress god's desire is for you to advance and we do that through through seasons. He then gave the anchor scripture for this point in ecclesiastes 3 verse 1 he says to everything there is a season a time for every purpose under heaven. We need to be careful because in life, 
there will always be complications of seasons. If you do not understand the season that you are in, if you do not understand what the word of God is saying for you in that season, if you don't know how to use the word of God for your own benefit in that very season, it ends up being a complication or compilation of cycles. It becomes a dry and difficult season. It ceases to become a season and it becomes a cycle. Remember the children of Israel were in a season where God was moving them from, the, from, from Egypt to Canaan. But they were, they, they, the wilderness experience then became like a cycle. And they kept on going round and round and round for many years and did not advance anyway. Be careful that if you do not know what to do in a season, if you do not know how to apply the word of God in a season, then your season will end up being a compilation of cycles. I encourage you to go back to last week's session and then get you know, the encouragement and get in deeper um, into, into, into what we're talking about. He did talk about the differences between seasons and cycles and he says, seasons change with time. Seasons entered into and they're exited into. There's never a time where we've had winter the whole year. We get into winter, we get into autumn, we get into summer, we get into spring. Seasons never last forever. There is a progressiveness with time when you are in a season. And I remember preaching around um, this point as well to say, it, it is important for you to have the realization of what you need to do in a season as a child of God. Whether it's a dry season, whether it's a good season, whether it's your season of harvest, you need to know what the word of God is saying. You need to know your position as a child of God. You need to know what you need to do for, you, for it to not be a compilation of cycles, for you not to go round and round and round and round and not knowing what to do in life. And then he says, cycles, they change, they change with us. You enter and you never exit. You continuously go round and round and round. There is a pattern of stagnation and a pattern of the same things repeating themselves over and over again. It is a season we get stuck in. Functions like, um, you know, functions like, uh, you know, you exact energy, you extend effort, there's no, you know, growth. In other words, your anxiety is growing, but you're not going anywhere. Time is changing, but the relationship, the resource, the mindset, the pace, the peace, your life is still standing still. You feel like you're running a marathon, but you're not going anywhere. Cycles can be demoralizing and discouraging and can even open doors of suicide and self-hurt. You know, opening windows and opportunities to dark thoughts in your life. The enemy will want, you, will want to affect you with cycles so that you can never see the other side. I pray that this year, this month, this week, whatever it is that you're going through, you know that our God is a progressive God. And knowing that, that should also encourage you to pray that, Lord, I need to know what this season you are, what this season is for. I need to know what I need to do in this season. I need to know the word of God for this season so that this does not become a compilation of a cycle. I need to exit this season, but I also need to exit as a winner. And then he went on to talk about your perception of God determines what you get from him. This is almost tied to what we talked about the very first week when we we're talking about um, um, how you perceive the word of God or how you receive the word of God really determines the effectiveness of how the word of God will work in your life. It's the same thing. How you see God determines what you get from him. Remember, we said that the Lord is an unchanging God. He will always be God. He will always remain faithful. He will always be remain. He will always remain uh, a, a victor. He will always be the God that he has always been. But how you see him, how you view him, what your relationship is like to, to you know, how vulnerable you are to him determines what you get to be what you get from him. If we read in Mark six, Mark six, um, Mark six two to five, it says Jesus in the synagogue. Jesus was in the synagogue and people looked at him as the carpenter's son. 
You can imagine they were in the presence of the King of Kings. They were in the presence of the Prince of Peace. Honestly speaking, I do not know what I would have done to know that there's Jesus in our midst and I, I choose to look at him in the flesh. But do you know what? This is what we do on a daily basis sometimes. When we are faced with situations, we've got the situation on the other hand, and we've got Jesus and the word of God on the other hand, and we, 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 we choose to believe what we can see with our own eye, and we don't choose to see and believe what the word of God is saying over our lives. And it's the same thing. How you perceive God, how you perceive God's position in your life really determines what you get from him. You know, I was listening to Ben Hinn the other day and he said, you need to have God be real, more real to you than your situation. That really ministered to me to say how I perceive God in my life, you know, should, 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 should make the situation or render it useless and powerless. Mark 6, 2 to 5, it says, And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, synagogue and, many hearings, uh, and many were hearing him were very astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hand? Verse 3 then says, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and mother of James, Joseph, um, Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us so they were offended at him but Jesus said to them a prophet is not without honor except in his own country among his own relatives and in his own house now you he couldn't do now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed him imagine I'm sure the synagogue was filled with people who were waiting to hear the word of the Lord. And he only managed to heal just a few. And I would like to believe the few were the few that had, were the few that had faith in what he was speaking. I'm encouraging you to have God in your life or rather to perceive God as the unchanging God the most powerful and mighty God that he is in your life, that it opens us to get access to healing, to get access to provision and to every little thing and big thing that we were given by God in the covenant that he made for us. I pray that your perception of God may determine what you get from him and he went on to talk about the god you see is the god you get you get salvation with no elevation or progression if god you see if the god that you see is similar to the one paul saw and he declared that in ephesians 3 20 that now to him who is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us if you believe if you start believing and seeing god the way Paul did see God, the way David saw God, I believe that many things will change in our lives. I believe that transformation will start be happening in our own lives. Sometimes I believe that we don't get the, the benefits of um, benefits of being believers, the benefits of being partakers of the kingdom of God, because we, we lack faith in who God is. We do not have an understanding, an understanding of the nature of who God is. The way we perceive him, we perceive him like, as, you know, like the flesh. It says, do not regard the Lord by the flesh, but by the spirit. And um, I just want to continue to say, you know what? The Lord is yearning to have a relationship with us where we understand who he is, where we understand his character, where we're understanding his divine nature. He's yearning to, to dwell in our lives, to reconcile with us, to be one with us. The Lord is yearning to be the Lord of the breakthrough in our lives, where we appropriate the word of God in our lives and it becomes tangible and things start, be, you know, things start changing. Our lives are transformed. 
There are a couple of number of um, amazing examples of what I'm talking about and what we've been talking about for the past three weeks. And we have the story of David um, that really reveals the progression um, of, of from the young young man who was diligent in listening from you know the instructions from his father to a young man who worked for the king and who was diligent enough to serve uh, you know the king and his people um, up until he was anointed and he was diligent enough to inquire um, of the Lord and uh, I'm going to read in Samuel two five seventeen you know, the, just the beginning where the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. And this text reveals David's accession to, uh, you know, uh, being anointed to the office of king. But in 1 Samuel 16, which is when we are first introduced to David, he was anointed, he was first anointed at his father's father's house. And this is a good measuring point for David's life. Um, Samuel anointed David, when he was only about 15 years old and he did not take the throne up until he was 30. Right. So that's another thing. Something was happening between the ages of 15 and 30 years in his life. David's ascension was an incremental. Remember, we talked about the God of advancement, the God that takes you from one level to another. It just don't it just didn't happen. On, on the go. The process of ascension was necessary to prepare David for the greater work ahead. I'm just speaking to somebody who is saying that the Lord has spoken into my life. I know that the Lord is an unchanging God. I know that the, the word that I've received from God is true. But however, nothing is happening in my life. I would like to encourage you and say, let may the Holy Spirit help you and may you have the patience to know that God is working something in you. Sometimes the process of ascension, uh, of, access, of accession is necessary to prepare you for the greater work ahead. David spent at least 15 years in preparation for the throne of Israel. There is always a burden behind every blessing and, he, and God delays the blessing at times to help build the greater task ahead. There were certain things that happened between the time that he was 15 years old, that he killed the, you know, he was killing bears and lions and whatever you, and he, by the time also he killed Goliath, up until the time he was, you know, he was actually appointed as king of Israel. There's a lot that happened, a lot of experiences that helped in the process of ascension, uh, spiritually, emotionally, and also physically for him. And this is the same thing in our lives. When God is building us, when God is maturing us, there's certain levels of, you know, ascension and processes that, you know, and procedures, spiritual procedures that we need to go through for us to be able to, you know, to be built for the greater task ahead. God is moving you incrementally for a reason. There is something that God is trying to build in you. Why would the Philistines come and attack when they just heard that he, was, he, he had received the final anointing? The enemy always knows that when you have been anointed, when the word has been spoken of prophecy, when the word of knowledge has been spoken over your life, forget that. Perhaps maybe no one has spoken a word of prophecy over your life. But what the word of God says in the Bible over your life, the enemy knows it. He is always, always going to come full force at some time in your season, in, in your life, in, in, in some seasons in your lives, to come and cause havoc because he knows that when you stand to believe what God has said over your life, when you understand that God is maturing you from one level of glory to another, you are going to be untouchable. It says that they knew what he did to their chief warrior as a shepherd boy. Now, with all the arsenal before him, could it, could it be there, uh, therefore, that there was, you know, fear of the future of what David could actually accomplish? Could it be that the attack was an indication of David's future? A lot of things happened between the ages of 15 and 30 for David. Could it be that the attacks that he had was an indication of what they feared in as far as David's future was concerned? May the attack on your life, maybe the attack on your life is because the devil is aware of the future that God has set for you. I just want to encourage you today to say, stay in the word. Know that God is moving you from one level to another, even though the season is tough, even though the season 
is, 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 is difficult, is dry. Just know that seasons will never last forever. Also understand that you need to know the nature of God. Believe in who he is. Believe that his God was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can either think, ask, or imagine. I pray that, you know, in this year of abiding in the Holy Spirit, in this season as we are unpacking the, the, the feast of the Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you are able to appropriate the word of God and know who you are in Christ and who know who God is in your life. May the Holy Spirit be upon you and your families this coming week and may you be blessed in Jesus' name.